Good evening and uh, welcome to Poison Pen Bookstore. Thank you for coming. We have a really interesting program this evening. We have Theodore Pappas here with us tonight. He is the um, Chief Executive Officer of Britannica Encyclopedia, as well as the Chief Development Officer. He's been with Britannica for 20 years, if I remember. Yes, 20 years already. So you started as a tot. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> He's going to be discussing uh, two books. One that he wrote called True Grit, which is about the impact um, 10 people have had on, on uh, culture in general and, um, and the common thread that runs through all of them, as well as the final printing. 250th year anniversary of Britannica, which he edited. <laughs> well, so that's going to be our program for this for this evening. Um, Ted will sign copies of the books after, if you like, and um, we will have Q and A after he finishes. He's going to make a slide presentation mm -hmm. on the history of Britannica, um, probably one of the greater impacts from the Scottish. Uh, Enlightenment period was the development of the Britannica, 250 years old, which is older than the U.S. Actually. And um, uh, it has an incredible history and the impact on, on the world in terms of the um, knowledge it's, it's given and the opportunity for people to, to learn. Uh, and then actually the forward that you wrote in the book, you, you talk about um, Got to go to my notes. We talk about your goal to communicate sound and reliable information, and in this age of fake news and everybody's putting out information, uh, the impact that Britannica is going to have, and uh, some of the items that you're working on. So, yes. um, my, I just have a question in terms of how you gather information for Britannica. In the, in the digital age and in the history of it, mm -hmm. uh, and how do you select people to write the articles and who edits them and that kind of thing? Sure. Uh, thank you. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be back at the Boys and Pen, and thank you, Larry, for, for hosting this. Uh, but what makes Britannica unique is that it's the largest fact checked general database in the world, and that's what makes it special. I think the bloom is, is off the rose of, of merely wanting to get our hands or have access to information today. We're no longer giddy with that feeling of just wanting to have information at our fingertips. We now want quality information. We want to know where the information is coming from. And that's the beautiful, uh, beautiful thing about Britannica is that it's fact-checked information. We use experts. We have subject experts in-house. We have a fact-checking department. And we use scholars on the outside. We've published more than 120 Nobel Prize winners, many uh, uh, countless Pulitzer Prize winners, experts from all walks of life, from the world of sports as well. If you're interested in golf, you'll have pieces from Arnold Palmer and Jack Nicholas and, uh, and others. And so we go to the experts, whatever the field is. You can't necessarily count on that in the internet today. And some of the things I'll point out is just uh, some of the great things we're doing with partners in order to surface credible information we know most people do not go off page one of YouTube, of, uh, of Google in their searches, or even look down to the second or third or the, the fourth source return. So how do we surface for people quality information and, and try to educate people to be a little bit more cognizant of the type of information, particularly students, that they're accessing? And that's some of the things I'll point out tonight. And I think one of the things you mentioned the last time you here was the fact that you have partnered with, I believe, Google and um, Apple. Yes, we have a lot of exciting partnerships. I'll point those out in a minute. And the one exciting one I'll show you is with YouTube. Um, with the brand new partnership with YouTube, uh, let me back up a little bit. YouTube came to us late last year. And like many social media sites, they're having a credibility of content problem of fake news, misinformation on their side. So YouTube came to us and said, how can we partner together to surface this more reliable information? So now as a result of this partnership, I'll give you a couple examples. If you do a search on YouTube on a topic around which a great deal of conspiracy theories have swirled, 
say, the Kennedy assassination or the moon landing. Hard to believe the moon land landing is, is a big conspiracy theory, but of course it is. Um, you will now get the Botanica article at the top of the YouTube search page and under the video in question. So YouTube is not suppressing community videos and your right to upload, your, your opportunity to upload community videos, but they think by partnering with Britannica, they're doing something to surface this more reliable information, bring it to the fore. You can then read the, uh, the well-written, fact-checked, uh, reliable summary of the topic first from Britannica, and then jump into the hundreds of community uploaded videos. So that's one of the uh, partnerships we're doing to try, to try to solve this problem. But there are, I don't want to say items that are uh, predicted, as well as fact in because I am reading the book, I mean, there was an article at one point on unicorns. Yes. <laughs> well, the beautiful thing about Britannica is that uh, it is the foremost mirror of the evolution of knowledge in the Western world. It's an unbroken mirror. And that's why many scholars view Britannica as a primary source document of sorts that you can study. So there have been scholars who have studied, for example, to give you one great example, a wonderful study on the concept of suicide and the changing conception of suicide as traced through the editions of Britannica. In fact, the very first article we ever had in the 18th century on suicide was called, and this gives away the feeling of how you approach suicide, it was called self-murder. <laughs> so uh, you can kind of see where we came from in the 18th century, but you're absolutely right. We're not embarrassed by the fact that we said you could find unicorns in South Africa in 1768. That was simply what people in the most educated minds at that time thought. There's also a wonderful entry on California, spelled with two L's, and it says it might be an island somewhere in the West Indies. That was in our first edition. That's, that's just the way it was. And of course, the cure for anything that ailed you in our first edition, headache, cancer, whatever it might be, it was a good bloodletting. So you just need to open a vein and bleed for a while, and that will solve everything. So it's fun to read those old entries, but it is a wonderful evolution of, of, our, of, of, of knowledge in the West. Well, yeah, and, and, and the breadth of it is incredible, because again, going through the book, there were articles on the unicorns, teething, yes. manure, <laughs> and a few other topics. That are <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful thing about the first edition was that other encyclopedias had actually offered short dictionary type entries. Other reference works had offered long academic treaties. Britannica, the beauty of it, was a marketing marvel. It was the first encyclopedia in English to offer both at the same time, the short entries and the long academic treaties in an easy to use A to Z format with helpful cross references and to do it in three volumes, not 32. So it was a rather portable uh, product for its time and that was the marvel of it. Right, I, said, I think the first one uh, in 1783, which is not the first one, but I think maybe the second was 2,600 pages, and 20 some years later it was 16,000 yes. pages. It ballooned. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. That's amazing. Well, I will let you proceed with your um, presentation, and again, we'll have a question to answer when, when you say. Thank you. I just want to start with two simple propositions that kind of the themes are run through both books I've worked on over the last over the last year. First, that passion plus perseverance equals grit, and grit in the face of change and great adversity in our lives spells success. And these are the two messages and lessons, I think, that kind of run through both books. Through um, the book on the left, which is the 250th anniversary edition of Britannica that I edited and, and uh, wrote the head notes for, and a rather long essay in there about its impact on culture. Um, in the book, and it's a, I think it's a fun book. I, I edited, worked a year on it, but it highlights our past, as Larry was talking about, some of our quirky old ans uh, old entries that show how um, evolution, uh, the evolution of knowledge. It talks about our present, but it also uh, g it gave me a chance to commission 33 special essays from <coughs> experts around the world in a variety of different walks of life, and I asked them to simply tell us what are they most concerned about in their field and for the future in their field. So for example, Martin Scorsese did a wonderful article for us in which he talked about film preservation. That's something he's very keen about. He's very concerned about the fact that 50% of films uh, before 1950 and 80% of all silent films have already disintegrated. Mm -hmm. 
or deteriorated to the point you're unwatchable. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. And so if we don't start to do something about film preservation, we're going to lose a great part of the history of a particular art form. So you wrote, um, you wrote on that. Uh, Secretaries of State James Baker and Madeleine Albright wrote on the future of democracy and cooperation with Europe. And I commissioned an interesting piece on cyberbullying from Monica Lewinsky. Uh, Monica was the very first person ever bullied online. Really ground zero of that concept of that cyberbullying is something we all need to be aware of. And why? Because the scandal and controversy she was involved <coughs> with was the very first scandal and controversy to break on that new and novel platform of mass communication called the internet. So she has a very particular perspective on that. So that's uh, the book on the left. On the right, as Larry was alluding to, I highlight how 10 history makers changed the world in, in very special ways by overcoming great turbulence and trouble in their, in their private and professional lives. And I think there's no company uh, in the world that's, have to, uh, that's had to overcome more social and cultural and, and especially technological change than Encyclopedia Britannica has. When we were founded in 1768 in Edinburgh, Scotland, uh, as Larry, you were alluding to, and it's, it's obvious, but the world was a radically different place. Most obviously, the United States didn't exist yet. But cameras, lights, phones, and cars didn't exist. Trains didn't even exist yet. And Napoleon and Lincoln, to put it in perspective, had yet to be born. So in light of that longevity and the fact that Encyclopedia is the oldest continuously published and revised work in the English language, I'm often asked the next question, is Britannica then the oldest continuously operated business in the world? And actually we're not. There are a lot of businesses that are older than Britannica, and they tend to be hotels, inns, pubs, and bars. <laughs> so it seems the oldest continuously operated enterprises in human existence are places where you can get drunk and places where you can sleep it off. That's just the reality. <laughs> Now, what's interesting about this slide, this shows the first edition of Britannica. Um, that's in our archives in Chicago. And I might just, a quick side note, starting this weekend, CNN will have a program called Club 100 that we're going to be featured in. Club 100 is CNN's show on companies that are 100 years or older. And they sent a film crew up from Atlanta a couple of weeks ago and had the opportunity to spend a day and a half with them, talking with them and opening up the archives, so they filmed the archives in Chicago and filmed this edition you see on the slide. So if you're interested, it's going to, the program's going to, the Britannica version um, edition is going to debut on Saturday at 8.30, and I think 1.30 and 7.30 on Saturday, and then 5.30 p.m. on Sunday night, and then run all next week. So if you happen to be watching the CNN, tune in, you, you might get a chance to see our archives with this edition. And again, this is the first edition, three volumes. And what's most interesting about this is that it's missing an article. There's a 43-page gap in the ends. And that gap is where the article on midwifery was supposed to go. Now, childbirth in the 18th century was the number one killer of women. And so Britannica, in service to, Larry, as we were talking, in service to our mission to bring reliable and useful information, not to a a narrow educated class, but to a mass audience. In service to that mission, Britannica thought it was critical to bring uh, concrete information about how to deal with difficult pregnancies, like a breech birth, while saving the life of the mother. The article, however, got Britannica in a lot of trouble. Uh, parents were outraged, and they weren't outraged by the, the article itself, the text. They were outraged by the illustrations. Britannica's three pages of illustrations were the most graphic images of childbirth and a woman's anatomy yet ever disseminated in England and Scotland at that time. And as I said, they caused a lot of controversy. Some parents threatened to sue Britannica because they felt the plates, the illustrations, were blasphemous, obscene, and pornographic. And King George III himself was outraged. He was not yet preoccupied with that little dust-up called the American Revolution, so he had time to worry about Britannica. So he encouraged all loyal followers of the crown to immediately destroy the Britannica article. And the fact that our own archived edition of the first edition of Britannica is missing that article 
leads us to believe the original owner of our own set was either one of these outraged parents or a loyal follower of the king who took the king's advice, followed the orders, and destroyed the offending article. But they, they didn't want, they still permitted the book to be published. Yes, we, they, we were not censored like the French encyclopedia scholars had to deal with um, on the continent, thank goodness. But there was a lot of pressure um, to destroy the article. And I point this out because also it's, it's another way in which Britannica has exerted its influence over two and a half centuries, not just through text, but through illustrations. And two other good examples. On the left and the right are two illustrations from our famed 11th edition of Britannica, which came out in 1910 and 1911. And in 1915, the Coca-Cola Company issued a challenge to all its bottlers nationwide. They said, design a new bottle for our soft drink, one so distinct that someone reaching for it in the dark or blindly putting their hand in the refrigerator could immediately tell them it's a bottle of Coca-Cola. So that was the challenge. And the Root Bottling Company in Terre Haute, Indiana, accepted the challenge, and they sent one of their employees to the library. The employee, a lot of folks, turned to Britannica. And they thought, wouldn't it be cool to design a bottle after the two main ingredients in Coca-Cola, the cola nut, or the cocoa leaf. Now the cocoa leaf is the main ingredient in cocaine. And traces of cocaine were in Coca-Cola all the way up to about 1929 when the last remnants of co cocaine was removed from the soft drink recipe. And you began to get this distinction during the Prohibition era of hard liquor, soft drink. Okay, so he went to the library, but instead of looking up the cocoa leaf or the cola nut, he pulled up the Britannica illustration of the cocoa pod the main ingredient in chocolate. And it's the Britannica illustration of the bulging ribbed cocoa pod that inspired the bulging ribbed Coca-Cola pod. Proving once again that yes, accident is often the mother of invention, right? 10 years later, 1925, folks who were in New York were ready to put out a new literary magazine that would become the New Yorker, and they needed a cover. Uh, they needed cover art for their first edition. Once again, the art director turned to Britannica. And in this case, they turned to our 1910 article on costumes and fashion through the ages. And you can see exactly where the New Yorker mascot and symbol of the New Yorker came from. It came from Britannica. And both the Coca-Cola bottle and, of course, the mascot of, of the dandy with the monocle is, uh, they're iconic images and both stemmed from the influence that Britannica has exerted, not through text, but through illustration. Now, Britannica, like any startup company, faced challenges. That's true today for digital companies, and no different in the 18th century. We had the issue with the king and, and outraged parents over the childbirth illustrations, but William Smelly posed a, a, a problem for us as well. William Smelly was our brilliant first editor of the first edition, did a magnificent job. He was quite a man about town. He was good friends with Robert Burns. Um, he liked to drink, he was in the pubs every night, he drank heavy. But he had amazing recuperative abilities. He could drink all night and then edit and write 10,000 words in the morning. Every employer's dream. So he did a wonderful job editing it. But at the end of the first edition, Britannica's owners announced they were going to add a new type of entry to the encyclopedia. Because the owners noticed people were increasingly getting their information from a new literary type, a new literary format. And so being good business folks, and just like today, publishers need to be aware of how consumers want to get their information and, and what kind of information they want. It was no different than the 18th century. And Britannica's owners, that a rising in popularity, that type of uh, literary format that was rising in popularity, was called the biography. So Britannica announced it was going to add biographies to the encyclopedia. Well, this outraged our editor, William Snow. He was a traditionalist. He thought encyclopedias should never lower themselves to dealing with the day-to-day -day matters and events of a single person's life, whether that person be a king or a Kardashian type of celebrity figure. And so he quit in a huff and left Britannica without its, without its editorial leadership. But Britannica's owners had nevertheless sagely discerned the way in which the marketing winds were blowing. And though we lost our editor, they really, by highlighting <coughs> biographies and incorporating biographies for the first time, they lent credibility to the use of biographies and reference works that have been common ever since. But we still were left without an editor as a, as a startup company. 
So we had to find a new one, and this is the man we found, James Teitler, another man about town, another heavy drinker, but a brilliant <laughs> editor. There's a common theme between some of the early Scotch editors of Britannica. Uh, he had three passions, though, that also posed problems for himself in Britannica. Number one, he was a daredevil balloonist, and he nearly killed himself on a, on a number of occasions. He was a man who understood mankind was destined to take to the air but he, he, he nearly killed himself on a number of occasions. And he's gone down in history as the first Briton to fly. Secondly, he was a political rabble-rouser. And so when he wasn't editing Britannica, he was writing these political screeds denouncing the king and saying, we need more people, we need more power to the people in parliament. Well, King George III had just got done denouncing Britannica's childbirth plates and illustrations. So now he turned his attention again to Britannica and swiftly issued an arrest warrant on Britannica's editor. So our editor left town so he would not be arrested. He, he fled Scotland, fled England, ended up in Salem, Massachusetts, and, and died in a drunken stupor a couple of years later. His third passion was women. And again, when he wasn't editing Britannica, he was taking note of the ladies of the night of Edinburgh, and he wrote a very popular book on the ladies of the night of Edinburgh. <coughs> a detailed guide to each woman on each street corner and their various assets and liabilities. No. He even ranked them and scored them and noted which women had teeth and which women did not have teeth. No. No. <laughs> First thing is kind of... <laughs> a, a very interesting guy. Um, and that's why he's kind of gone down in history because it seems likely he took women up in his hot air balloons as well, and some hanky-panky and canoodling probably followed. Mm -hmm. So not only was he uh, the first Briton to fly, <laughs> the editor of Britannica's second edition, but he's also likely the founder of the Mile oh, High Club. <laughs> 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 this isn't a chapter of Britannica's history we often highlight with school groups. <laughs> you all are getting the adult version of this talk. <laughs> Our offices um, are in Chicago, and this is a, a very common panoramic shot of Chicago that you'll see in news reports and films and TV shows. Our building is the um, seven-story brownstone in the middle. We've been an American company since 1901. We've been headquartered in Chicago since 1932. And we've been in this building here um, on the Chicago River um, in 2000, since 2005. And there are two special events in our building's history that I think are, are worthwhile to quickly point out for you. Number one, in, in July of 1915, a year after our building was built, <clears throat> our building was the site of the second worst maritime disaster in American history, the Eastland Steamliner uh, disaster. And it's often called the um, Titanic of the working class because on this day in July, it was supposed to take the families and children and the workers of the Western Electric Company out on the Lake Michigan across the lake to Michigan City, Indiana. But as 2,500 passengers boarded the boat, uh, boarded the board, uh, boat right outside our uh, building on the Chicago River, naturally people took to the top deck and to the far railing. And as more people went up and out, the boat began to list and lean and list and lean to finally it capsized. 844 people drowned in the Chicago River that day, many of them women and children and entire families. As the bodies were pulled out, they were brought to the lower level of our building where we have some of our archives to this day. They were lined up for identification purposes, so our building was used as, as a temporary morgue. And for that reason, for people who believe in such things, our building on tours of Chicago is often referred to as the most haunted building in Chicago. Though I have yet to see a ghost there, but that is what our building has been called. Interesting also, a 20-year-old employee of the Western Electric Company was supposed to be on the boat, but he arrived a few minutes late, consequently saving his life. That employee, however, was nevertheless listed in the newspapers of the next day as among the dead. And that person was George Hallis, the founder of the Chicago Bears and one of the pioneers of the National Football League. And uh, you kind of wonder maybe how the National Football League would be different today if George Hallis had perished that day in Chicago. Another event, in our building's history was in 1926. In the 20s, Chicago was a bustling place and the streets were increasingly getting busy as a result of that increasingly popular new means of mass transportation 
of the automobile. More and more people have cars. And so on the west side of our building, that's LaSalle, that's LaSalle Street, mm -hmm. needed to be widened to four lanes, which posed the owners, a, a predicament for the owners of our building. You either have to tear down our building, which is called the Reed Murdoch Building, or you had to change it. And they decided not to destroy it, but to modify it. And so if you look closely, there are only five vertical bays of window to the left of the clock tower. There are six vertical bays of window to the right. It was so beautifully done, they sliced out a bay of windows on the left and recreated the, the, in, the in stones and caps. That unless you're looking carefully, you really don't even notice it's, that the whole symmetry of the building is actually off. But for me, and for a company like Britannica, that's had to persevere and adapt to staggering change, this is a perfect metaphor and symbol. Mm -hmm. You either adapt and survive, or you die. And so I think for philosophical reasons and, some, and, and symbolism, it's just a perfect building mm -hmm. for Britannica to have its headquarters. Britannica is doing extremely well today. And if you haven't checked out the encyclopedia, just go to Britannica.com and you can get an idea of what the, the digital form of the encyclopedia looks like today. Our last print set was in 2012. It was, a, it was a bittersweet day when we announced the end of the print set. Mm -hmm. But obviously the world was changing and the way in which we get our information and print and publish information had, had changed by that time. But we're doing extremely well. We have offices in Chicago, New York, Springfield, Massachusetts, which, which is headquarters of one of the sister companies we owned, which you all know, and that's Merriam-Webster Dictionaries. That's one of our companies. We have offices in London, in Tel Aviv, Sydney, Australia, and Tokyo. Um, we have 88 countries of the world which are currently using Britannica electronic products in their schools or in their classrooms. So almost 90 countries of the world. And our combined websites are gathering 5 billion page views annually, which is more than 400 million page views a month. So we're doing extremely well. These are some of the brands associated with Britannica or that we have partnerships with right now. I mentioned Merriam-Webster in the top left. In the top right, Britannica Knowledge Systems is another one of our sister companies. This is one of our companies in Israel. They produce the training platform for, uh, the learning platform for training the service and maintenance crews in the aeronautics industries. And some of the clients they're working with are American Airlines, British Airways, NASA, the US Army, the Israeli Army, the um, Canadian Air Force. We also have a, a new partnership with National Geographic to produce middle school material and social studies. Uh, I mentioned the YouTube partnership. I'll say something else about that in a minute. ND is NetDragon. This is a partnership uh, we just finished a couple of weeks ago in China. NetDragon is one of the most dynamic mobile gaming computer companies in China and in the world. And we're going to be teaming up with them to produce pretty interesting educational gaming material uh, for, for teaching kids. So that's exciting. And we also have learning products in the works with either the ministries of education or the national libraries for Egypt, Libya, Nigeria, Ghana, Lebanon, South Africa, and Qatar. Many of these products will produce in, in English and then they'll be translated into Arabic or native languages afterward. So you can see we're doing an awful lot of things since the old print encyclopedia. I mentioned the YouTube partnership and just to give you an example of what it looks like. So if you look up the moon landing, you will now, as I mentioned, see in the shaded area right here. You'll get the Britannica article first as a wonderful primer if you want to read, and it's also highlighted under the video there. So again, it's a way to surface credible information and make it easy for the public. We can't force people to read it, but we think if we bring it to the fore and make it easier to access, we're doing something, I think, to improve the situation. One writer who's noticed how well Britannica has been doing is Dan Brown, the, the famed author of The Da Vinci Codes. And as he writes in his latest novel, he has a section on Britannica. The fax machine has gone the way of the dodo bird, and the iPhone will survive only if it keeps outperforming its competition. Typewriters and steam engines died in changing environments, but the Encyclopedia Britannica evolved. Its cumbersome 32 volume set sprouting digital feet and like the lungfish, which can survive on both land as well as in water, expanding into uncharted territory where it now thrives. Mm -hmm. So again, what Dan Brown understands are the two propositions I mentioned at the beginning about passion and perseverance equal with grits, and grit that can, in the face of great adversity and change, can spell success. Another man who, who very well understood that 
with Steve Jobs, who was fond of saying, I'm convinced that about half of what separates successful entrepreneurs from the unsuccessful ones, the non-successful ones, is pure perseverance. And I can't think of better examples of the power of perseverance than in the 10 individuals I highlight in my other book, True Grit, Classic Tales of Perseverance. Now, I think you all probably recognize the 10 people. In the upper left, uh, the first row, you see Madeleine Albright, our first female Secretary of State and former Ambassador of the United Nations. What a lot of folks don't realize about Madeleine Albright is that before she got into government and foreign affairs, she worked for Botanica in 1960 in her advertising department. She was not involved with anything having to do with government. Her husband is a prominent Chicagoan journalist who was stationed with the Chicago Sun-Times. She needed a job. And when she came to apply for the job, she was grilled by a male executive. And she talks a little bit about this in one of her autobiographies. She was grilled, not surprisingly, a male executive. This is 1960, very much the madman type environment in, in American culture at that time. And of course, she was asked questions that no HR director would ever get away with asking anybody <laughs> today. But it was 1960, and it was perfectly legal. So the male executive of Britannica asked her point blank, this is all right. Do you plan on getting pregnant? To which Madeline replied, not at this moment, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to, her, to her right is Clara Barton, oh. the founder of the Red Cross. To her right, you have Theodore Geisel, better known as Dr. Dr. Seuss. <laughs> Very interesting life. I think we all know his books, obviously, but I don't know how many people understand how difficult it was for him to break into children's literature. And then the crisis he personally had to persevere through when his wife committed suicide mm -hmm. and the guilt he felt for why she committed suicide. It was a very difficult period in his life. Walt Disney, and then we have Marie Curie, the first woman to win a Nobel Prize, the first person to win two Nobel Prizes. She won them in physics and chemistry. And a person who we always know of, and they're always mentioned in our history books, but here's a good example. We never really explain how they achieved what they achieved, what they went through, and what they had to suffer through for the achievement. We just say what they did, the years they accomplished, and it's a little red date. We ask our kids to repeat it on exams. What people don't realize is that she suffered a horrific sex scandal at the turn of the 20th century as one of the few women in an entirely male-dominated field, field of physics. And what she went through in France around the turn of the century with this very embarrassing sex scandal is a very interesting story. Then we have Thomas Edison, who is fond of saying, I've never failed in my life. I've just found 10,000 ways it won't work. <laughs> we have Ian Fleming, creator of one of the most enduring characters in all of literature and film, that being James Bond. Then we have Ruth Handler, the founder and creator of the, the Barbie doll. Again, a lot of people might know her from that, but in midlife, she lost the Mattel company. And then she was stricken with breast cancer. And how she persevered through those two things, very public humiliation with losing her company, and then the private struggles with cancer, and what she did and the company she created in the second half of her life for breast cancer survivors is a very moving story that I think a lot of people don't realize. And she was fond of saying at the end of her life, when she, uh, she was asked, you know, what is the, the story of your life? How do you summarize it? She said, I've gone from breast to breast. Meaning the controversy over Barbie's breast, it still rages to this day to the point that she got breast cancer. So she kind of tracked her life from breast to breast. Fascinating story. Abraham Lincoln and then Joe Lewis, the heavyweight champion in the 1930s and 40s, the man who rallied African Americans to the war effort in, in World War II, and really the first truly national American hero, an American hero among both whites and blacks. And so very interesting story there. And what I'd like to do is just end you, uh, leave you tonight with just a, a, a quick passage from my book about what I think these 10 individuals uh, have in common and what makes them so special. How did the great men and women who changed the world actually do it? Were they simply smarter or more talented and privileged than the rest of us? enjoying higher IQs, superior educations, and better skills and connections? Was it just a matter of greater genius, talent, gifts, and opportunities? The simple answer is no. For beneath the veneer of their famous accomplishments, we find frequent battles with adversity, 
serial setbacks and defeats, and personal and professional hardships they endured along the way. And it's here, amid the dark underside of achievement, that is seldom illuminated by our history books and seldom taught our children, that we find the special quality they possessed in common that connects their life stories and that paved their way to greatness and world influence. And that special quality is that life-changing mix of passion and perseverance commonly known as grit. But these masters of grit were not immune to fears of failure to moments of self-doubt. In fact, as the reader will see, quite a few of these individuals suffered repeated bouts of depression and so-called nervous breakdowns. They were all too human in this regard. But it was during these very times of crisis when their character and convictions were challenged to the core that they once again distinguished themselves. Rejecting the role of victim, they would never fully surrender to the devil of doubt or allow such a demon to haunt them for long. They refused to be permanently disabled by defeat, paralyzed by self-pity, or derailed from pursuing the destiny that brought meaning to their lives. They understood that scars are a sign of where we have been, not where we are going. And so through all the setbacks and disappointments they encountered, they could tap an inner strength, a special resolve, and find that critical reason to get up the next morning and trudge on in pursuit of their life's mission. And in the end, we find in the lives of these masters of grit, the locus of the human capacity to rebound and push on, their passion to succeed, their singleness of purpose in the face of repeated failure, and the sense of urgency with which they live their lives can inspire us all, renewing hope and faith in our own ability to endure, to succeed, and even to change the world in our own special way. Thank you. Thank you. I have one, one question. Uh, how did it, Britannica get from Edinburgh to Chicago? Well, they were bought out by two Americans. Two Americans were very interested in seeing the success of Britannica on the UK transfer to a market which was the budding market at the turn of the 20th <coughs> century. It was no longer the UK and the dimin diminishing British Empire. It was the opening up of America. America was the place where all the immigrants were going, the jobs were, the academic world was beginning to boom in academia and around the turn of the century. America was simply exploding. And so they very presciently understood future market, you open up the American market, you have millions and millions of additional English readers. You're not confined to the diminishing British Empire anymore. Uh, the empire was still big, but it was diminishing. And so it was simply, it was a wonderful and savvy marketing move to buy it and move everything to America. Mm -hmm. um, we'll take questions from anyone if they have. Did you have a difficult time choosing 10 people? Sure, I, I certainly did. How did you did. whittle it down? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I'm, I'm often asked why these 10. It could have been 10 any, it could have been 10 others, mm -hmm. and then 10 others from those. What I wanted to do though is pick men Pick women, pick folks of different races, different centuries, different backgrounds, different socioeconomic families. Ian Fleming and Madeleine Albright both come from very privileged backgrounds, extremely wealthy. Joe Lewis and Abraham Lincoln were dirt, were dirt poor. Walt Disney and, uh, and um, we have Thomas Edison uh, were both physically beaten by their fathers. Uh, others were cherished and given them anything they wanted and doted on, and given an extraordinary amount of love. So I wanted to show that the, the power of perseverance is the secret to success, and it doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, black, white, rich, poor, from the 21st century and having all the digital tools we have, or the 18th century or the 19th century, or if you're in the hard sciences, or you're in business, or you're in children's literature. It's really, can you pick yourself up after you fail? And that's a lesson we're not often teaching our kids through our gifted programs, through our special leagues we put in all the time, which is all fine and good, but teaching them to understand that they are going to have to deal with those times when they come up short. Amen. And how do you deal with that? And it builds character for them and they it don't It does build character, that. absolutely. So I, that's really the reason I wanted them to be a really diverse lot. Good Thank question. you. Any, any other questions? Um, I'm a teacher and a bookbinder's daughter. 
And um, one of the things that I am noticing in my school and my kids at school as well as my own children at home is that they have no clue how to use a library. And so when we ask them to do research on a topic or whatever, their first inclination is to go to the internet, yes. which truthfully is mine as well. Like on the way here, we were Googling like, why are air conditioners on the top of houses in Phoenix? Um, so, <laughs> we, but when we ask them to research something, they don't know how to use a print primary source. Um, so I think it's awesome that you have adapted and changed with the Britannica, but how does, how does an entity like Britannica address that, that we're losing the print sources and that we're raising a generation of kids that have no clue what to do at a library? Right, it's a, it's a great question. And then what we do an awful lot of as well is professional development, and we're beginning to craft and build our own digital literacy curriculum. Uh, we're going to be addressing this. We're, we're not alone, by the way, in having this. It's a great question. We're not alone with this problem here in America. We also are big in Britain, not surprisingly. And we have an event actually we're doing, hosted by an MP, a member of parliament. We're going to have an event at the House of Commons on June 24th that I'm, I'm working to put the finishing touches on right now, in which we're going to be talking about the need for digital literacy programs in Britain. And obviously we're gonna do it, we wanna do it here as well. But you're absolutely right. You do need to teach them how to use sources, how to look beyond page one of a Google search, mm -hmm. be a little savvy and think not just because it's a related result, it doesn't mean it's a relevant, accurate result. Simply because it comes up one, two, or three on the Google page one doesn't mean it's exactly the best source for you. But how many of us check the sources of the websites we pull up? Now, in most cases, it's not that big a deal. If you're just trying to find out, you know, when did Ross, you know, propose in which episode of Friends, <laughs> it's really not a big deal. You know? If you got to go on season four or season, season five, who really cares when Rachel said um. yes or no? But if it's something more important than Rachel and Ross, you want to know the source. And why we take a great deal of pride at Botanica that you can rely on, on uh, our references. One other thing Botanica <laughs> is doing um, you can download something that's called Britannica Insights. Go to Britannica or just Google Britannica Insights. It's a very simple tool you can install on Google, and then whenever you do a search on Google, if Britannica has an article on that topic, it's going to come up in the top right rail, at the very top of the page for you, and you'll have the free Britannica article on that topic. It takes five minutes to download it. It's called Britannica Insights, a very simple tool. We've made them available to schools and we're encouraging all our schools and, and classrooms to download it as well. Again, it's one way I think we can help surface credible information and make it easier for people because we realize not everyone's going to look at page two and three and four and five, and, and especially kids. I saw, I saw a study recently that kids were complaining that if they can't find the answer to their research topic within 20 minutes, they want to change topics. Oh. Now, somebody who's been to graduate school, a lot of you have been to graduate school, you think, well, my goodness, people spend three or four years researching a dissertation, and you can't take 20 minutes before you change topics. That's the downside of the digital revolution, of having so much information at our fingertips so quickly, you begin to have that mindset. And so you're absolutely right. We have to, we have to teach about how to, to mitigate that. You're right. We need our libraries back in school. Uh -huh. Card catalogs. Yes, card catalog. <laughs> Any other questions? What do you see as Britannica's future revenue streams outside of just licensing and things like that, with governments and stuff? Yeah, it's 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 really multifaceted. We have a pretty well thriving consumer market. If you go to Britannica.com, you'll see the encyclopedia there. Like many websites, it's ad based. Right? So you have some revenue there. In the institutional market, we work very often from the top down. So we will work at what we call B2G contracts, business to government, which is why we're really working with ministries of education around the world. We just finished up earlier this year a year or so project uh, with the Ministry of Education in Egypt. It was a very big project for us. We we're very happy about it. it. turned out well. And I think that will be like the prototype for us to go to other African countries needing solid educational information that can be translated in Arabic because of the Muslim population. So we work with B2G, we work then at the county level, 
and we work at the state level. Recently, last year, we got the contract for, for all of the public schools in, in California, which is a big contract for us. So we kind of work at that level, and anybody can subscribe to Britannica and get our database for $70, I think, if you don't want any ads, um, and get it that way. But we also have teacher aids. We have wonderful uh, packs called um, your, your Teaching Launch Packs in Social Studies and Science that build an entire content of information that can be easily accessed and used and, and pushed out to, to kids around a particular topic. So in science, if it's photosynthesis, or let's say it's the Great Depression, you can get that one launch pack that could be your whole pack for that, for that week and that lesson. It will have the differentiated learning at three different reading levels, the Great Depression article at three different levels. It will have your photographs of the Great Depression. It will have your primary documents. And it will have videos. And it has quizzes as well for assessment. But we understand teachers are strapped. You can probably speak to this yep. better now. You are strapped for That's time and the things. How much does that cost? <laughs> and it's, it's surprisingly inexpensive. We're talking a couple of dollars, two and three dollars per student for the entire year to have material that's fact-checked, reliable, and most importantly for teachers, packaged in an easy way that you can use and push out to kids for personalized learning. That's something we need to understand. Not everybody reads at the same level. So can you offer it in three different levels? And Britannica does. Hmm. So we have a lot of teacher aides. We, again, work with larger contracts. Um, and we also, I don't know if you noticed that, we had on their Amazon Alexa, one of the companies we have partnerships with, and Samsung. Before long, Britannica content is going to be coming to you from your Samsung appliances in your kitchen. Whether we like it or not, voice activated microwaves and refrigerators and stoves are gonna be talking to you more and more. And, and if they are, we hope it's gonna be with Britannica content. So that's part of what we're doing as well. We can get into recipes. Then. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we can get into recipes, exactly. Um, when, when you commission somebody for a topic in, in today's world, they're, they're pretty um, technologically advanced topics that I'm assuming are on botanic. Yes. You say you're fact-checked, but who's fact-checking that if, you, if you're dealing with subject that is something difficult? Yeah, I, I, it's a very good question. And at some point you have to call it quits. How many times do you fact check the fact checkers and, and things like that? But number one, we have subject editors. And so if you know, we have an in-house expert on uh, who knows an awful lot about sharks, and so they know the two or three people to go after, if we need that article on the nurse shark, for example, we know who to go after for that article. And then we also know the sources by which we can fact check that and then ask the, the person. So we have in-house experts who help weed out where to go and they have a pretty good handle on, on their subject area. So we know which experts and scholars to go to as well. So what, what is the process then? Because that's ongoing. It is 24 seven. We update around the clock and that's the beauty of digital publishing. If somebody dies tomorrow that's prominent, covered in Britannica, we can within a few seconds have the death date and the cause of death and whatever else we need to do to touch up the article. In, in past years, you couldn't do that. Let, let me give you an example. The last print set in 2012, and I'm, I'm not giving away any huge company secrets here. The print set is, is, is long gone. But it's a wonderful example of the limitations of print, something as editors and publishers you don't miss. Britannica never had an article on Beijing in 250 years. To the very last, when we announced in 2012, the end of the print set, the article was Peking. Now, the rest of the world had called it Beijing for decades. Why didn't Britannica? How do you move a giant article from the P volume to the B volume? You can't, <laughs> without enormous, huge cost. And the time factor of butchering up two volumes of the encyclopedia with a giant article, you can't move it. The decision on jazz was made back like in 1972. Mortimer Adler, who designed the, the, the format of the last edition, thought there was no need, and again, how times have changed. No one needs an article on jazz under J, right? You would never go and expect 
to, to zero in on a, on a J to find jazz, of course you're going to read, as a man of letters, Larry, you're going to read 85,000 words on musical theory first. And then you will tease out that section on jazz. That's in musical theory. That was my plan. <laughs> well, of course, the world doesn't work that way anymore. And so we never had an article in J's, our main coverage of jazz, is under a musical topic, under M. You can't do that anymore, and thank goodness you can't. You can zero right in on the information you're looking for. But it's a good example of the limitations that we had in print that we don't we don't miss whatsoever. Uh, I, I re read at the end of the book, and I didn't read the whole book, but I did read the end. There have been people who actually read the whole set, uh, which is remarkable. Yes, uh, they were telling the truth. But yes. What, yeah. Can you tell us just a few of those? Yeah, there, there are a number of famous people and scientists, and, and uh, I'm trying to remember some of the names. You can maybe help me out. I have a list of them um, in the afterward. And if you look at the book, the afterward, I think, is a kind of a fun place to begin. It is. Um, uh -huh. To take a look at I call them the whole setter club because there are people who read the whole set of Britannica. And even as Ray, uh, A.J. Jacobs is, is a popular writer who's written a number of fun books. A.J. Uh, Jacobs came out with a book about 10 years or so, or, or so, in which he talks about his trek through the encyclopedia reading the entire set. He came to Chicago and interviewed myself and a couple of others uh, about working at Botanica. And so we decided to, for the fun of it, put him to work as, a, as an honorary editor for the day. So A.J. Jacobs worked at Botanica for one day. But that is part of the challenge that people really wanted to have that. And it's a challenge that, as I point out in the book, uh, some people hand it down. A dad would do it, and then they hand it down to their kids. I'll give you my set of Britannica, but you have to read the whole set. Hmm. That's the challenge, and then it's a challenge to the grandkids as well. Britannica was also given by folks, um, and, and uh, given to folks and handed down through the generations as a gift. And it was very, very much cherished. Uh, and I also talk about... Um, just the, the many places Britannica ended up, like in the South Pole, with Ernest Shackleton's doomed expedition of 1914 through 1916. Ernest Shackleton, um, Shackleton, the great British explorer, who right after World War I broke out, he took off for an expedition, and the ship very quickly got penned in ice, and they were marooned for almost two years. And how Britannica was really used used as a life, as a life of sorts. Not literally it didn't save them, but psychologically and socially it did. They learned to play games. They read other biographies of explorers and how they survived and what they ate to survive in polar regions. They argued over the articles. It gave them something to do to stay mentally stimulated and when they didn't need any more mental stimulation, they even ripped the pages out, filled it with tobacco, and they smoked the set. <laughs> so it's the only case in Northern which Britannica was also smoked. And there's a wonderful part in, in Shackleton's diary in which he notes that there's one occasion when they smoked the set. It was um, a case where one of the youngest, the youngest member on the, on the crew had horrible frostbite. Again, they're two years living on ice floes. It's extraordinary. Even the shirt that the ship was called Endurance, what an apt name. They had to amputate the poor kids' toes. They were just black and brittle. And after they took the toes off, um, they said, well, what we can do for you? He said, I'd like to, I'd like to have a cigarette. <laughs> Give me a cigarette. So they ripped pages out of Britannica, and they filled it with tobacco, and they gave the, the kid the smoke. And it was a very cramped quarter. Again, they're living on ice floes, and the operating room was nothing but a rowboat on ice blocks covered by tarp. And they did the surgery there. And they noted in those cramped corners with all the men huddled together that the men got a kind of a high off smoking Britannica. <laughs> and and one, of the, one of the crew members thought, and it might have been Shackleton, thought it was because there was potassium nitrate in the paper. Now potassium nitrate historically if you have paper dripped with potassium nitrate and, and dried, and then crumple it up and put it in a glass and light it, and put a towel over your head, it helps calm the lungs, and asthmatics have used it for centuries. And so actually, there could be some 
medicinal explanation of why they got high off of smoking potassium. I can't confirm it had potassium nitrate in the 1910 edition that he took with him to the South Pole. But think of this, out of all the things to take on an expedition to the South Pole, where space and weight are limitations, he took Britannica. Because Britannica was a symbol of the empire. And everywhere the empire went, Britannica followed. And if the sun never set on the British Empire, it never set on Britannica either, which is why we find Britannica in the further reaches of the empire, whether it's, it's Kenya, it's South Africa, it's India, even the, even the South Pole. It's incredible, isn't it? Any other questions? It's kind of nice, I think, because the generations now, and even some of the teachers in that, they kind of have tend to try to change history or omit it from there because they think it's no longer needed or they don't believe that's the way it was. So it's kind of nice that for those that are interested, they can really still find the truth. I think so. I think so. Absolutely. Yes? Uh, does Encyclopedia Britannica have any plans uh, in the education realm to do anything similar to like a Khan Academy or partner with Khan because there's just so much uh, that you guys have to offer that there's a multitude of ways to package it for people that homeschool or right. Kind of stuff. Right. Um, we have some similar things to that now with our launch packs. Uh, we have something called um, well, we have a variety of video-related uh, products. So one brand new, one, brand new one is called Looney Labs that teaches kids how to make their own videos mm -hmm. in their own classroom, and, and you as a teacher might want to look at it. If you go to Britannica and, um, and look up Looney Labs, teaching kids how to create their own videos for their own school projects. Mm -hmm. So kind of creating their own Khan Academy because we're giving them the easy-to-use platform and the tools mm -hmm and the rights-free images and the rights-free videos that they can use to build whatever they want. If it's a history tape or a math tape with some type of illustrations, and they can build their own and we're teaching them digital literacy. So yeah, we've thought about some things like that, even for post um, high school market, maybe continuing education a lecture type series. We, we've been approached by that idea before. So it's, it's a very good idea. It's something we definitely will be considering. Cool. One more question. How does Britannica protect the information uh, from outside attacks or digital threats? Uh, it's, it's a problem. And we have uh, a very good legal department. We have a number of threats, uh, particularly from the Far East, hmm. um, yeah, India, China. Uh, we have folks, there's, there's a product in the East right now being sold as Encyclopedia Britannica. It's not us, and we have to take them to court. And so uh, it was a problem throughout Britannica's history. Um, in fact, real quickly, the third edition of Britannica came out in the 1790s. It was very quickly, the plates, as soon as the plates came off in Edinburgh, they were shipped to America. And a guy in Philadelphia named Dobson produced the American version of Encyclopedia Britannica in the 1790s. He pirated it. We sold it. And two people who bought it, it was on their bookshelves, George Washington and Alexander Hamilton right before he was killed. And, but it was, it was a magnificent publishing feat. Stole it. But it was a magnificent publishing feat and was the largest publishing project in the early United States in the 1790s. And that was publishing Britannica. And there were unique challenges like how do you publish a dollar sign and things like that. The fonts they had to create. To, to change certain things from Britannica UK to the American market. But pirating is a problem today. It's a big problem you hear in the news a lot, particularly with um, digital technology. It's, it's an issue we have, intellectual property rights. But it was a problem we had in, um, going back to the 18th century as well. Thank you. Thank you. We're just going to uh, close off the Facebook.